This is Outside of New York, in-depth discussions with members of the art world who live and work outside of New York. And here's your host, Craig Gould. Ted Kincaid is a Dallas-based artist whose work challenges the notion of photography as a subjective record. Through the use of digital and traditional processes, Ted is creating a new type of painting informed by photo imagery and a new type of photography influenced by painting. He received his BFA from Texas Tech and his MFA from the University of Kentucky before returning to Dallas to set up his practice. He has been reviewed in Art Forum, Art Paper, and Art on Paper, and is included in the permanent collections of both the Dallas Museum of Art and the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, as well as a host of corporate collections, including a massive 700 square foot canvas in the Dallas Omni Convention Center Hotel. Ted is represented by a number of galleries around the U.S., including Tally Dunn Gallery in Dallas and Devin Borden Gallery in Houston. I recently sat down with Ted at his home in Dallas where we discussed the veracity of the photographic image, pictorialism, the sublime, the former grandeur of Valley View Mall, and the current state of arts education. Anyway, um... Ted, I, I appreciate you being willing to, to join me today and sit down and have a conversation. Um, My pleasure. Yeah. So, Ted, where where did you grow up? Where where did uh, where did you get your start? I I might as well be a native Texan, uh, but technically I'm not. I was born in Chattanooga. Oh wow! And lived there uh, until I was six. Mm-hmm. And my father was transferred to Kansas City. Okay. And so uh, we uh, moved to Kansas City, and I moved to Kansas City with a huge Tennessee drawl. Right. Like really. So what kind of work did your dad do? My dad was a nuclear engineer, and he was in nuclear sales for combustion engineering. Wow. So. And so uh, so Kansas City, uh, I guess Kansas City seemed more urban than Chattanooga. Well, Chattanooga is a big city. Um mm-hmm. Kansas City was very different. I had a really hard time there because my ki- the kids uh, kidded me mercilessly oh, man. about my drawl and um, I had to go to therapy, uh, speech therapy right. for it. And um, we were only there two years, but I, uh, when we were transferred to Dallas, uh, when I was going into third grade, mm-hmm. uh, I moved down here sounding like a newscaster. Uh, it was really funny how quickly, right. you know. Right. Well, yeah. Well, they they talk about trying to. My my wife is from uh, from Springfield, Missouri, and you know they talk about how, um, especially like at Mizzou, you know, has a, a huge journalism program going back, and part of the the attract uh, part of the attraction was that this nondescript Midwest accent that can play in in all the markets. Right? Yeah, it is. It's the newscaster boys. Right. And so, uh, you have you ever done any newscasting? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, because from third grade on, I've been a Texan. And um, the Texas twang came out probably about 10th grade. Right. And, and got more pronounced uh, during my undergraduate in okay. Lubbock. Oh, well, so. that, that will happen. So what? Um, so when you moved to Dallas, what uh, what part of Dallas did you wind up? We we moved to the north end of Dallas, which you know at the time was LBJ, right? And uh, we lived at a house near Forrest and Abrams, which mm-hmm. was uh, in Dallas city limits, but Richardson schools. Sure. So I went to Skyview Elementary and Forest Meadow Junior High, and then Lake Highlands High School. Right. Spend time at Valley View. Oh yeah, I mean Valley View. Valley <laughs> View was the shit. You know, it it had just opened when I'd moved here. Um, right. It was you know 
it, it was the mall, right? You know, I, I remember I remember Valley View in its heyday, and it's it's so surreal to uh, to go back over there now. Uh, I think I can't. I think it may even be boarded up now. I went over there probably about two years ago, and I was just like, "This is this is way too surreal for me." Because you it have is, it's, it's, you it's have like these a dream because yeah, because you, you have these memories. You have these specific memories of exactly how you know amazing it was in your head, and then you walk in and like, "Oh wow, it's a skeleton of a, of a place." But I, you know, I, that that happens in. But I, I guess that's typical of malls all over America. It is. They're dying. I mean, they're they're dying in a big way. Yeah. Um, and, and I don't, you know, when I think back to Valley View, I mean, I'm, I forget how old I am frequently. And we all try to. <laughs> and when I tell my students stories about, you know, growing up in Dallas, because they're always like, what was it like when you were a kid? And right. I'm like, in many ways, it was it's exactly the same right. as, you know. Your experiences. I mean, we've you know things are obviously different, but I'll describe things like Valley View, and I think I was describing Farrell's. You mm-hmm. remember Farrell's? It was this Victorian ice cream? Oh, right. Parlor that right, everybody right. went to for their birthday, and I'm describing right. it to the kids, and they're looking at me like I'm just insane. Right. Like what? <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. There was. Uh, I, I had a conversation like that last night with my wife because uh, we had driven by a place that used to be. It was a Swinson's, which was like that. Yeah, same thing. And it was, you know, um, up at uh, Park and Coit, and now it's um, an Asian food restaurant, right? And, you know, it just kind of reflects the changing demographics of of things. um, But so you you moved to to North Dallas, and you said you went to Lake Highlands? Yes. And um, so where... Where did you start figuring out that that you uh, you had this bug for for art? Where you know that you were creative? What, was it be in Chattanooga? In Chat, wow. I mean, and I I drew and built things obsessively mm-hmm. um, from the moment I could hold a pencil or a pen. Um, I drew all the time. I got in trouble for drawing all the time. Um, I was that student that uh, struggled a lot in my early years. I had a pronounced reading difficulty and um, a number of other educational issues. So what I would do on all of my work is I would draw obsessively Mm -hmm. around every part that I wasn't supposed to write or fill in. (laughs) And literally there were like these bio tapestries drawn, you know, around the border of every single piece of school I ever turned in. Right. Wow. And so, uh, so at what point did, did that upset? At what point did your parents, I assume that at some point your parents uh, tried to help you nurture that obsession versus dissuade you? Or They I, did. I mean, they never dissuaded me. Uh, the teachers were dissuading me uh, right. because I should be working on my work. And, you know, that's what the parent conferences were always about. Right. Uh, but my parents never dissuaded me. They were baffled. Um, I was very different than, you know, the child they expected. Um, I listened to music all the time. I, I, was, I, was, I was withdrawn. Were you an only child? No, no. My, I had a sister who was six years older than me, mm-hmm. or have a sister. And um, she's an extremely social animal, and I wasn't. So right. we were just very opposite. Right. So you, you said uh, listen to a lot of music. And, yeah. Uh, and so what kind of music were you... Uh... Um, I was I was uh, the first and second grader that was borrowing the classical LPs from the music teacher to take home, and I would listen to those pretty much all the time. Wow! Uh, with the exception of um, my first my first music was uh, every Friday my mom would give me a quarter, and we would go to Kmart because that's where you bought your music from right. then. And a forty-five mm-hmm. cost a quarter, so I would buy a forty-five, or my sister would buy a forty-five. And so we had this awesome collection of sure. Motown forty-five. So that was actually my very first music, but I quickly fell into classical. Wow, that's great. So did you ever uh, did you ever learn to play an instrument? Or? I yeah, my parents bought me a little cheap keyboard. Uh, it was one of those strange kind of spook house Hammond organ. Yeah. I had one of those. And um, I played with that. I never took lessons. Mm-hmm. Um, difficulty in reading music was the same to me as difficulty in reading words. Right. And so that really put me off. I ended up, um, I guess it was in 
I don't know when they make you choose an instrument. Mm-hmm. The band called. Well, my, my I think son it was sixth had, grade. Yeah, that's exactly. My, my my son's in the fifth grade, and next year he's going to sixth. And we uh, last week we went to his school to pick an instrument, and so. Yes, you've you've identified the the right time frame. You know, sixth yeah. grade. Well, it was. Uh, I went to that, and the band director was like, "Oh, you you look like a euphonium player," <laughs> which was hysterical. Wait, did they and, tell everybody that because that's what they I, said to my son. Yeah. Well, that's uh, that because they need a euphonium player. <laughs> right. You know, they 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 desperately need a euphonium player, and so I I took that up and I I played it into high school and. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it to me it, it wasn't a, I'm a def, I don't know of anybody who, who would say euphonium is their passion, right. uh, but it was never a passion for me in terms of band. I loved music and I mm-hmm. loved playing music. Um, playing the euphonium was kind of funny to me because nobody else really played it. Right uh, in high school, my band director uh, got extremely peeved at me one time and put two empty chairs next to me. And pointed at me and he said, your third chair. <laughs> and I was like, okay. <laughs> I guess. Um, I ended up being drum major. Uh, mm-hmm. Which was good for me because it was, you know, one of the first times I was able to come out of my shell. But um, after senior year, I kind of dropped that. Mm-hmm. Okay, so uh, so what about art in high school? Did uh, Were you part of a program that kind of nurtured that side of you? Or? Yes, but um, I took one art class in uh, junior high and it what it it was basically the kids came in and kind of did whatever they wanted and it was mm-hmm. kind of a holding pin. Right. Uh, you know, we joke even now in teaching that, you know, that there's that certain section of art one that's sort of like right. an entire different form of humanity is dropped off of a ship and put yeah. in your classroom for that one period. Right. Uh, and then they get back and get back on the ship and go up, you know, wherever. Right. Uh, I was in that class, evidently, in junior high. And so I did not take, although I was drawing all the time, right. all the time. Um, that's what I did every weekend, every evening. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I didn't take another formal art class until I took uh, a photography class at Lake Highlands. Right. And that clicked with me in such a way that, you know, no other discipline had clicked with me before. Sure. And um, after that, I went into, uh, I was taking photography, and then I ended up going into the art program at Lake Highlands for my mm-hmm. last year, and okay. so my whole senior year. Wow. So you, you're, so how much art were you studying in that senior year? Uh, well, it was two periods, Okay, uh, which was a lot for, you know, sure. that time. But, you know, there was a wonderful thing when I went to school called a um, CLEP test. Mm-hmm. You get credit by examination. Sure. So there were a number of classes that I could get out of and didn't have to take, and so it opened up. A lot. Uh, yeah. My passion, though, in, in high school was history. Mm-hmm. We had an incredible history teacher, and I actually credit her with turning me from a pretty poor student into an honor student when I graduated. Sure. Um, she she made every difference in the world of turning me around. Sure. And um, I think of her a lot because you know she she was one of those great teachers that you were you were slightly scared of in a mm-hmm. good way, and that you didn't want to disappoint them. So right, right. And so, uh, so from Lake Highlands, you, uh, you head to Lubbock, head to Lubbock. I had, I knew I wanted to be an artist. I always knew I wanted to be an artist. Mm -hmm. And, um, I had a really good counselor that helped me look at schools and got me a scholarship at tech in Lubbock. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I was young and my parents really hadn't looked at a lot of colleges. So we were kind of blind. Right. Uh, and it was sort of like, this is a good deal. Let's go here. Let's try this. Um, and I went there, and my parents had insisted that I couldn't be a fine arts major mm-hmm. uh, initially, that I needed to make a living. So I went into graphic arts, right? Uh, graphic design, and I lasted a short year <laughs> in graphic design, and right. I begged them, and they agreed to let me switch over to photography. Yeah, you know, it's a funny, that's that's a recurring theme that's coming up in my conversations, are, are uh, artists who uh, who tried to fulfill the parental obligation of making a living by committing to studying graphic design and then figuring out real quickly that, you know, just because you're artistic doesn't mean you have the brain for being a graphic designer. Well, absolutely. The big part of it is, is you've got to learn, you know, that it's not your will, it's the client's will. Right. And, 